So there in Deuteronomy chapter 27, of course, keep something there uh, tonight, but go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 4 as well. And when you get over to Romans, uh, keep something there. We're going to come back to Romans several times uh, this evening. But what we see here is Moses leading the children over into, the, uh, into Israel or into the promised land. And he's telling them when they get there, they're going to set up these two great stones upon these mountains. And one of these stones would have the curse and one of these stones would have the blessings that they would, they would uh, write the law upon these stones, rather. And what it's showing us here, first of all, is that the law is, is, is something that is uh, a burden to us, right? These stones were supposed to be, you know, imagine carrying a stone up this mountain. That probably wouldn't have been a very easy task, especially back then. You know, they didn't have all the diesel heavy equipment to just, you know, put it on the flatbed and, and truck it up this mountain. This would have taken a lot of work to do this. And it shows us that there's a, a burden involved here with the law. Now, if you're there in Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, look at verse 19 where it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world be, may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So that's what they were supposed to write upon these, on these stones was the law. And, of course, we know from Romans and other passages as well that the law is what condemns us. It's the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. As Paul said, you know, I, I was alive on, uh, once, but when the, uh, the law came, sin revived, and I died. It was the law that condemned him. And what he's doing here is he's setting up these stones, and these stones are a picture of the law. That's why he said there, you shall set up great stones right upon them all the words of this law in Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim to bless and Ebal to curse. So these laws were on great stones. What is that, and what is it showing us here? That they were large and they were easy to see, right? He's saying, look, write them upon these great stones and they're going to put them up, up on the mountain so that everybody could see them. That was the purpose of it. So that when they get over to these two mountains, they could look and everybody in the congregation would be able to look at these stones and see the law that was written upon them. And what I think that's showing us is that our guilt as human beings is obvious, you know, if we go out door knocking and knocking on people's doors and, and, and trying to win them to Christ and preaching the gospel, you know, it's very rare that you run into somebody that doesn't admit that they're a sinner, you know, at least admits to, you know, that they've told a lie. Now, I have had that happen. You know, I've knocked on somebody's door and she and I said, well, you know, we're all, you know, we've all told a lie. She said, well, not me. And I, after a little bit of conversation, you know, it was pretty evident that this individual, you know, was, had a few screws loose as well. <laughs> So generally, everybody in the world, you know, it's pretty easy to convince them that they're sinners. We don't have to look very far in this fallen world to see the effects of sin. We don't even have to look that far in our own lives and in our own hearts to see how we ourselves are sinful people. And I believe that's what this is picturing in the Bible when God is having him set the stones up on these two great mountains these, with the law written on them. He's saying, look, everybody's, everybody's going to see it and recognize the fact that they've come short of the glory of God. It's showing us that our guilt is obvious. If you look there in Romans chapter 2, go back a few pages in your Bibles to Romans chapter 2, God says that these things are even written on our hearts. That man, even without the use of these physical stones, is convicted in his own heart of his sin. It's obvious even just from uh, your, your own conscience. If you look there in Romans chapter 2, verse 14, it says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, so they don't have these, these things written down, they don't have a physical book, that they can open up to that has all these commandments. They didn't have these stones set up to remind them of their own sinfulness. It says that they have not the law, but they do by nature the things contained in, these, in the law, these having not the law or a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts uh, the mean while excusing or excusing one another. So we could see that, you know, Everybody has an understanding that we are sinful. It's very obvious, and I believe that's what the Bible is uh, pointing out here, or what it's, it's illustrating. But it says there in verse 4 in Deuteronomy, again, just keep something in Romans, it says there in uh, verse 4 that they, these were to be set up in Mount Ebal. That's what he said there. Therefore it shall be, when you shall be gone over to Jordan, you shall set these up, up these stones which I command you this day in Mount Ebal, and thou shalt plaster them with plaster. So again, just showing you that there was this great burden, that this was something they had to put a lot of effort into. You know, in this chapter, we only talk about the cursing, but in other chapters, we get more into what was written as far as the blessing, what was pronounced, the, the blessings that were pronounced. 
But what's interesting is that when you're other, whether you're talking about either you know, the curse or you're talking about the blessing that was pronounced, that both of them were set up on mountains. You know, both of these stones were taken up to the mount and set there. One mount was a picture of the curse, and one, picture, or one mount was a picture of the blessing that came uh, through the law. You know, the law does condemn us, but also the man that liveth in them, you know, he shall be justified. You know, if we, if we do live according to the law, God will bless us for that. You know, we understand we don't do that to go to heaven, but if we keep these God's commandments, if we love the Lord and we, and we strive to live uh, as he would have us, then we know that we also receive a blessing. What I want to point out is the fact that they're both on mountains, meaning this, that it takes effort to do either one. You know, if you want to live, people get this notion, this or idea in, the, in, their, in their lives that, you know, if they just cast off the things of God, that if they don't, if they don't listen to, to God or man, they just kind of do their own thing, whatever feels good, that somehow that's a liberation or somehow that's not going to take a lot of effort. But the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. And that if we, you know, if we choose to go up that mount of cursing where we're, go, we're fighting the law of God, we're going against the word of God, you know, there's going to be a lot of difficulty and trials and tribulations that come with it through living a sinful life. And we understand that, but we also have to understand that even when we're going in the path of God's blessing, when we're trying to keep the law, keep the commandments, live in godly in Christ Jesus, to walk in newness of life, that also is an effort. That also is an uphill battle, even as much as, as living a sinful, wicked life is too. So I think that's kind of the picture there too, the fact that they're both set up on mountains, showing us that either way you want to live your life, if you want to live a wicked, sinful life, it's going to be hard. If you want to live a life that's blessed and used by God, you know, it's, gonna, it's, you know, it's still going to require effort on your part. You're still going to have to exert some energy in order to attain that. Now, if you would, turn over to, uh, turn over to keep something in, in Deuteronomy, and just go back to Romans real quick, though. <coughs> so we see that the blessing, it came from Mount Gerizim, and the, and the cursing, it came from Mount Ebal, right? So here's another picture here in the Bible, the fact that, that these two things are different, that they're, they're far apart from one another, that they're, they're separate, they're, that works and, and uh, grace cannot be mixed. So we see, first of all, that the blessing... It came from uh, the, mount, the opposite mount, Mount Gerizim. We say that in verse 11. <coughs> so we see also that, that the law is not only a curse, but it's also a blessing. So if you look there in Romans chapter 7, look at Romans chapter 7 and go to verse 7. We saw, first of all, that there was this curse that came from Mount Ebal, right? And in the Bible teaches us that there is a curse involved with the law. That if we are to be justified by the law, you know, we're fallen from grace, the Bible says in Galatians. It tells us that whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offend at one point is guilty of all. So we understand that there's definitely a curse that the law brings to us because of our sinful nature, but there's also a blessing that comes from Mount Gerizim. Look at the, uh, uh, the, the law, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 7, verse 7. It says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Yea, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive once, uh, well, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained unto life, I found to be unto death. So is it, is it God that, that made the law death or is it us? It's us. Because when, when, uh, when we sinned, you know, by one man, uh, sin, entered in the, uh, uh, sin came, entered into the world. And death passed upon all men. You know, we know that by one man, Adam, we all have inherited this fallen nature. But that's not the fault of the law. That's the fault of our own sinful nature. So it is ordained unto life, but we find it unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and slew me, by it slew me. But he goes on and he ends there and says, Wherefore the law is holy, and, by the, command, and the commandment holy and just and good. So we don't ever want to get this, this uh, out-of-kilter view of the Old Testament or the law specifically. And this is something that's prevalent today in a lot of churches. They just want to discount the law. They just want to just say, well, that's Old Testament. You know, that none of that applies today. We're all under grace. You know, there's now, therefore, no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. You know, but that same verse goes on. It says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So even as Christians, as saved, born-again people, if we do continue to walk after the flesh, we will suffer the chastisement of Christ or of God, that we're going to be uh, punished for our 
you know, misbehavior, essentially. So we don't want to get this, balance, this view of the, of, of the law, uh, um, you know, out of balance or out of whack. We want to make sure that we're not just getting this dismissive attitude. Because as we read all the things there at the end of the chapter there of Deuteronomy 27, you know, there's a lot of things today that we would probably say, yeah, it's still a good idea to not do a lot of those things. And we'll get into that here in a minute. So, so what I'm trying to just put down, uh, lay down right now is the fact that, look, the law is a curse and a blessing at the same time. The question is really, what mount are you going to climb in life? Are you going to go after the, you know, up the, the, law, the mountain of cursing, where the law is just nothing but you know, uh, a condemnation to you? Or are you going to try and climb that hill of God's blessing? You know, are you going to go up that other one where, the law, where, where you strive to keep the law and God blesses you for it? <clears throat> you keep something in Romans there. And what I think this is also showing us, when the fact that God is separating these two mountains. He's saying, you know, you got this one mount here, the curse, and the, one, the other mount with the, with the blessing, is that, you know, these cur- the curse and blessing, they're coming from two op- opposite mountains. They're coming from opposing mountains. And what's that showing us is that they cannot be mixed. You know, you, you, can't, you, can't have, uh, you cannot have works and grace at the same time. If you're there in Romans 11, look at verse 6. It says, "For And if by grace, there, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. I mean, the Bible could not be any clearer. We all know Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. But how many people are out there today that have this, this, this notion in, that that somehow, oh, yeah, it's all by grace, but we still have our part to play as well. They say, oh, it's, yeah, I know Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, but I also have my part to play in salvation. Well, I think God showing us these two mounts. He's showing, look, there's, there's the curse and there's the blessing. It's works or it's grace. You know, and, and we understand that you know, the Bible makes it perfectly clear that nobody can work their way to heaven. It's not by being good enough. So what is he saying here in Romans 11? Look, it's one or the other. It's either grace or it's works. But it can't be this strange, you know, mixing of the two that every false religion in the world tries to do. I mean, that's how what every, all religions that, that, are, that are out there, essentially at their core, what you find is some kind of works. It's, they're all work-based. And really, that's what makes true Christianity different than every other religion in the world, is the fact that it's saying, look, you have nothing to do with it. You have absolutely no part to play in your salvation other than to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has done all the work for you. So I think that's what he's kind of illustrating, or that's another picture uh, of the gospel that we can see here, that we have two different mounts. We have the law being a curse, and we have the law being a blessing. It's either grace or it's either works. It's one or the other. And, you know, we could turn to several different passages and, and, and see that throughout the scripture. If you're there in Romans, just go back to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse 20, 21. Romans 3.21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, unto all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So we see again, just over and over again, and we could go through so many other scriptures that just show us it's not by works, it's by grace. But there's so many people today that don't understand that, that they don't have a clear understanding of this. And that should really, you know, help us to understand the importance of what we're doing when we're sharing the gospel with somebody. You know, you're bringing the light of the, of, of the gospel of Christ to them, and you're opening up the word of God, and you're showing them the truth, that they cannot be saved by their own works, that they have to put all their faith in Christ. And so many people do not understand that today. That's why, you know, what we do is very important when we go out and we win souls. <clears throat> now, if you're there in Deuteronomy, we'll look at here at verse 14. Keep something there, Deuteronomy 27. In verse 14, the Bible says, And the Levites shall speak and say unto the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, work, uh, abomination unto the Lord, the Lord excuse me, the work of the hands of the craftsmen and putteth it in a secret place and all the people shall answer and say amen. So what is he talking about here? Now he's getting into the specific things that God is cursing. Of course, this isn't an all-inclusive list. 
You know, there are many other things that God calls abominations, that God calls a curse, that will bring a curse upon you. This is just a few examples that he's going over. And one of the first ones he's touching on here is what we would call idolatry, the worship of idols. And what I want to point out today is that he says there in verse, or verse 15, Cursed be the man that maketh any craven or molten image. Now, that's a really important word, any. You know, because we have a whole group of people today, you know, in several uh, different, you know, religions, you know, Buddhists, uh, you know, the Hindus, the Catholics, the Greek Orthodox, you know, we could probably think of several other ones that actually worship or pray to or venerate these actual statues. You know, anyone that's ever been in a Catholic church knows that's the case. I mean, you walk in there and it's just idols everywhere. (coughs) And of course... Catholics are not completely ignorant of what the Bible teaches. You know, this isn't the first time a Baptist preacher has gotten up and called out the, the, uh, the Catholic Church for their idolatry. So they've definitely crafted some, you know, very clever arguments or some real cute ways to try to get around this. But at the, at the end of the day, I don't, they'll, say, they'll say things like, well, you know, we're not worshiping the statue of Mary. We're just showing some very serious respect here. You know, we're just, we're just, we're just showing our, our love and admira- admiration for the mother of Christ. No, you are bowing down to them. When you're bowing down, when you're praying to them, that is a form of worship. That's what they're doing. And, it, you know, regardless of what reason they're setting up these statues and carrying them around on their stretchers to the streets of, you know, all, we've all seen that, you know, where they have this big ornate statue of, of Mary and they got, you know, a bunch of guys carrying all these flowers everywhere. For whatever reason they do that, the Bible says right there, they shall not make any graven image. Not one. Not any. Not your your statue of Mary. Not any of your your supposed saints that you pray to. They they were not to make any of them. And, uh, you know, even even if they're being used as the Catholics, like say, well, we're just using it in religious worship. Well, God said don't make any. You know, period. At the end of the day, you're just not allowed to do it. And they have several different objections and, uh, you know, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, I'll read to you from verse 4. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. They're saying, oh, we're not worshiping them. You know, yeah, we bow down to them. Yeah, you know, you go into the donut shop, you know, and, and, and the, the Hindu or the Buddhist back there, you know, I've seen this, you know, has their little Buddha or their, you know, uh, Hindu God on the on the table, and literal you know cup of coffee and a donut offered under the <laughs> idol. You say you're making it up. I've seen it, friend. You know, <laughs> it's out there. I could take you up to the the one up on 35th Avenue and and uh, in the 17 Rainbow Donuts. They they've got it there. You know, people do that. And they say, yeah, but you know we're not we're not worshiping in them. We're just you know we're just uh, venerating them. We're just respecting them. But God's saying, look, you're not to bow down yourself to them or to serve them. You know, you know serve the donut to the, the next customer. You eat the donut. Don't give it to the idol. You know, <clears throat> for I, he said, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. So right there, God's showing why he takes the sin of idolatry so seriously, because he is a jealous God. Because all that worship that they're giving under this, fault, this, this, you know, this porcelain image, this molten image, this piece of wood, you know, is something that this should be given to God. And God is jealous for that praise. I mean, it'd be like any one of us who have children. We go in, you know, and, and if, 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 if there was another man that, you know, present and our children started to call them dad. So, oh, he called, started calling them dad. I started thanking them for the clothes on their back and the food in their bellies and the, and the roof over their house. You know, any father is providing would, would be upset by that. He'd say, no, that's, that's my, I deserve that respect. I deserve that praise. I'm the one who's provided all these things. Don't give it unto a stranger. Don't give it unto a, someone who's not doing those things. But that's exactly what's going on when people get into the involved in this practice of idolatry. When they start to worship Mary and pray to Mary. You know, Mary doesn't hear you. She doesn't hear you. You know, she's not this mediatrix. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's it. And all that praise and worship should be directed towards God because God is jealous for it. And he says, you shall not serve them. He said in Leviticus 26, you shall make no idols nor graven image. So I don't care what reason they're, they're making it. I don't care what cute little argument they have 
to try and tiptoe around this. He just says, don't even make it. So as, as soon as you make it, you're already breaking God's commandment when it comes to this thing of idolatry. He's saying, don't even make it. So, you know, I don't care what the purpose is behind making it. Once you make it, you've broken God's commandment. God says, don't bow to them and don't, and don't even make them. And, you know, people will say, well, you know, that's not what the Catholic Church is doing, you know. And when I originally wrote this, it was written for an audience that, in Tucson that was actually much closer. So forgive the scale of these pictures tonight. But does that look like it's just me showing, the Pope just showing respect to the statue of, of supposed baby Jesus? When you're taking, getting down on a knee and bowing down to it? Or how about this one, where he's got, you know, his little incense here that he's burning onto this ornate statue of Mary? This is just him showing respect. This isn't worship. Folks, that's what the Catholics will tell you. If that's not worship, I don't know what is. I don't care what you call it. That looks like worship to me. What about when you're kissing it? When you're putting your mouth on this thing and giving it a big smooch? You know, that, that is not, you know, or you're kissing the knee of the little baby Jesus. But they want us to just look at that and say, oh, that's just, you know, religious worship. They're just using it in a religious service. That is worship of an idol. That is idolatry in any way you cut it. And it doesn't matter, even if, if you wanted to call it something else, they've already broken the, the God's commandments when they made this. When that thing rolled off the idol factory line down at Idols R Us, they were already in sin before they even burnt any incense or kissed any knees or passed it around for a bunch of dudes in dresses to give it a kiss. You know, that, I wonder if that's going to be kosher with, the, with the, the social distancing now. You know, how, are they, how are they kissing the idols? Are they sanitizing it after each kiss? I don't know. But that's not, that's not just casual, you know, observance or respect or something like that. That is straight up idolatry is what we're looking at. <clears throat> so, you see, God here, he goes into several things about the curse of the law. He, he deals out all these curses. You know, and, when, and God, you know, often I believe in the scripture puts things in order of priority. You know, maybe not always. Maybe that doesn't apply here. I mean, you know, you gotta, he, he's got to lay it all out there one way or another, but... He starts out with idolatry, and then it kind of gets, there's some things that are down, further down the list that are, that are pretty bad too. But one of the first things God brings up is idolatry. And God brings up idolatry over and over and over and over again. Now he talks about, you know, the one that probably popped out was bestiality, you know. He says, if you do that, you're cursed. But that's not something that I think is prevalent in society. And that's not something that God hammers a lot in the scripture. He does touch on it here and there. But idolatry is just something he hammers in over and over. Why is that? Because as you saw a moment ago, that's what people do. There's just something in man that is just religious by nature that if, it's, if, it, if that part of him is not directed towards the true and living God, he will direct it towards something. Whether it's his own mind, his own vain imagination, or an actual physical idol. So I think that's why God you know, laid it out there first and hammers that in the scripture about idolatry and keeps bringing it up over and over again to them. But keep, uh, you know, going in further into this chapter here, you know, what we want to keep in mind, I kind of alluded to this earlier, is the fact that, you know, we don't want to develop this we're not under the law philosophy. I mean, think about it, which is, as I mentioned earlier, very prevalent in churches today. To say, you know, we're not under the law, we're under grace, you know, all things, you know, are, are profitable, we're not all things edify. This kind of, you know, this kind of mentality that's very dismissive of the Old Testament and the things that are written. And that's really kind of dangerous ground, and it's really very irrational. It's very illogical when you start to think about the things that are actually written in the Old Testament. I mean, some of the things that we just read tonight. Would we really want to develop this, it doesn't, it, it's, that's Old Testament towards some of the things we read here tonight? I mean, it goes on about incest and bestiality and all these other things. Should we just, should we just say, oh, hey, you know, we're not under the law anymore. We're all under grace, so have at it, you know? Of course not. No rational human being would say that. No normal, you know, functioning individual would, would be okay with that. But that's exactly what they're saying when you develop that attitude. And they want to pick and choose. They want to say, oh, well, you know, we're not under the law when it comes to these, these other sins. You know, we can drink and fornicate and, and so on and so forth. These things that might be a little come more naturally to us, right? But you can't, you can't pick and choose. You can't be selective about what you're going to dismiss and what you're going to adopt from the bible you know it's not this it's not just this you know a la carte kind of you know buffet style christianity that people are promoting out there it's the whole enchilada you, you get the whole thing when you get uh when, you, when you're talking about the bible 
so um, <clears throat> where, would I, where was I at here? <clears throat> so yeah, you, we can't just sit here and, and pick and choose what it is that we want to believe. And this is the, the real dangerous uh, attitude that's out there today. People want to have this, you know, have it my way kind of Christianity. And, and they want to say, well, something, you know, this is all done away. You know, these things don't matter. You know, it's okay to go ahead and, and you know, and do these things that are written in Deuteronomy chapter 27. I mean, is that the kind of attitude we're going to have? Of course not. But is that say, does that mean that all things apply from the Old Testament? Of course not. And we understand that there are very specific things that God does away in Christ, but they're very specific. God, you know, specifically talks about them in the New Testament. If you're there in Romans chapter 14, go, or Romans, go to chapter 14, if you kept something there. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of, a ne of necessity a change also of the law. So yes, there is a change the, of the Old Testament law and those things that pertain to the priesthood specifically. You know, God still has the same view of bestiality and incest and sodomy and drunkenness and all these other things that we read about in the Old Testament. His mind hasn't changed. You know, it's Jesus Christ the same today, yesterday, and forever. But the things that have changed, he specifically spells out in the New Testament. And it's things that pertain unto the priesthood or the Sabbath days. <clears throat> You're there in Romans 14. You know, people are always going on about, you know, you got to keep the Sabbath. We're always getting these emails and and I always see comments, you know, online where people say, hey, you're, you're, you're in sin. You're not observing the Sabbath day. And he says in verse 5 of Romans 14, one man, steameth the day, uh, one, uh, one man steameth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be filled with persuaded in his own mind. So God is not putting an emphasis on the Sabbath. In fact, you know, Jesus didn't, didn't keep the Sabbath. In fact, Jesus broke the Sabbath, if you recall. And that's what the Pharisees were getting upset with him about in the New Testament. You know, when he went out and he, you know, began to pluck the ears of corn and him and his disciples ate, you know, they, they were, that was done on the Sabbath, you know. And that's a whole other sermon right there. If you would, go over to Colossians uh, chapter 2. Actually, go over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. The Bible says, you know, there are things that are done away from the Old Testament. But you know what? You know, lying with your father's wife and with your mother-in-law and, you know, all these other wicked things, that's not it. Those things are still in force. And so is the vast majority of the law. So this, this idea of this philosophy of this has all gone, gone away, that you know, all these sins that God was against in the Old Testament, are, he's now okay with, that's somebody leading you up the wrong mount. That's somebody reading you, leading you up you know, the mount to God's curse, where you got, they're just going to lead you right up, you know, doing all those things that God hates and detests and God bringing God's curse and chastisement upon your life. That's why it's important to understand this. The Bible says in Colossians 2, I'll read, I'll read to you, it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he requickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in lying with a beast, or kissing your grandma, or you know, looking on your parents' nakedness. Is that what he said? No. He didn't say, let no, and let, no theref, let no man therefore judge you in anything out of the Old Testament. That's not what he said. He said, in meat, in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of a new moon, or the Sabbath days. When God takes something out of the Old Testament and says, this no longer applies to you, he spells it out very clearly in here. And so, you know, I mean, here's the thing. Does, it, does the New Testament have to repeat everything we just read in the Old Testament? Is that what Christians need today? Do they need a whole, just a whole other, you know, uh, you know, utterance, you know, just another complete, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Do they just need God to just repeat himself again in the New Testament? Or was the Old Testament good enough, you know? Why don't you just go read that? <laughs> so God already said it once. I mean, the Old Testament's pretty long. You know, do we really need another volume of, to reread the same things over again that God doesn't want us to do? Of course not. Now, if you're there, keep something in Galatians. I'll read on here in uh, Deuteronomy 27. He said, Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother, and the people shall say amen. Now you say, what does that mean? I don't know. 
If you have any thoughts about what that is, you know, I have some thoughts. I'm not entirely sure what that means by that. You know, I, I have an idea, but I don't want to just float things out there. So that's what verse I've always read and, and wondered about, okay? So just being honest, you know, going verse by verse, that, that's my take on verse 16. I don't know. <laughs> Is that all right? So verse 17, he said, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and the, all the people shall say amen. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say amen. That's an interesting one that's in there. It's, it's one of those laws or cursings that God puts upon people you have to read that and you think to yourself, who in the world would ever do that? Who in the world would ever lead the blind out of the way? But people do this kind of thing, don't they? I mean, I remember there was this viral video long, uh, years ago of this, this kid at some high school or junior high or something just wailing on some blind kid. And then somebody had, you know, some other kid had enough decency to just cold cock the other kid, you know, blindside him, and said, dude, he's blind, what are you doing? And they knew he was. You know, so people are out there, they'll take advantage of people that are, you know, uh, you know, have a disability. You know, whether they're going to physically assault them or maybe they'll, you know, it reminds me of the story of my, my, uh, my stepdad used to take me to these, these softball games. He was part of these, like, you know, these little softball leagues. And we'd go to these softball games, and there was this blind guy that would sell candy. And he had a little table out, and he had all these boxes of different candy bars. And you could go up and give him some money. But, and I remember, I remember my stepdad saying, hey, Make sure, don't try and pull anything with him. He could tell what, what bill you handed him by the way it feels. You know, I was a kid, you know, the, the candy bar was like, you know, a dollar or something like that. Or if you try to get multiple things, you know, maybe add it up to five bucks, and he'd be like, well, I'm just going to give him a dollar and tell him it's five. I mean, he's blind, right? But we, he told us, hey, he would just, he'll just feel the bill, and he'll know whether or not you handed him a one or a five or a ten. Of course, we were kids, you know, pretty gullible. We're like, wow, you know, we're, you know, we didn't try and test it out. And I think the guy kind of put that out there because I, 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 maybe it was just my imagination as a child, but I remember him taking that money and feeling it like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, hey, would, would somebody think to do something like that? Well, why would you need to tell a kid not to do that? I mean, of course, they, would, they think of these kind of foolish things. Would somebody really lead the, cause the blind to wander out of the way? Would somebody set a stumbling block for their, for their brother to fall over? Yeah, these type of things happen. Um, I mean, look at all the other things we read about tonight. I mean, God, God's not just, you know, putting filler in the Bible. But really, you know, uh, I think what we could take this verse here, verse uh, 17, or verse 18, rather, and apply it spiritually. You know, there's a lot of people that are doing it spiritually. You might not see people, you know, leading blind people out of the way, causing them to wander out of the way physically. You know, but I think we do see a lot of it spiritually. You know, the, the, the Bible tells us that, you know, the, the lost, the, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that, that believe not, that they're, they're spiritually blind. They can't see. They need someone to open the gospel and preach it to them, you know, and help them to understand the Holy Spirit has to get involved. They're not just going to come to these things on their, no, on their own, and in the meantime, they are blind. And there's a lot of false prophets out there that will cause them to wander out of the way that will take advantage of them spiritually just as much as somebody might take advantage of a blind person, you know, physically. <coughs> and what we would call those are false prophets today. And we see this type of thing all the time. I mean, the devil, he's great at this. This is his whole shtick. This is what he does. He sets up, he knows that these people are blind spiritually. They're groping in the dark. They're trying to find their way to truth. And he's got ways to just lead them out of the way so that they don't find the truth. Lead them down this path. Lead them down that path. He's got all of his tricks, all of his different uh, tr ways of just leading people and causing them to wander. And he uses false prophets is what he does. And if you're there in Galatians chapter 1, look at verse 8. He says, but though we or an angel from heaven, you know, and I, I don't know what the Mormons don't understand about that. And they'll say, oh, we, you know, we received our writings from an angel from heaven. Well, you know what? You got a different gospel. And the Bible is very clear here. Though we or an angel from heaven... Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. That's strong language that God's using there. He goes on and, and, and doubles down. It says in verse 9, As we said before, so say now I again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than ye have received, let him be accursed. You know, God hasn't changed his mind when it comes to people that are going to lead people out of the way, that are going to cause the blind to wander. He's saying they're cursed. You know, and as much as we would curse the individual 
who would, you know, set a snare for someone who's physically blind or take advantage of someone who's handicapped, you know, we, would, we should curse the person that would preach lies and heresy and lead people away out of the way spiritually. It's actually worse. I mean, you think about it. People can at least maybe recover physically. But if you cause someone to lead, uh, to go out of the way spiritually and they die and go to hell, there's no coming back from that. That's a permanent thing. So let these people be accursed. You know, and, and we're all familiar, I'm sure, with the book of Jude and the, way, the strong language that's used there. He said, but, uh, but though we are an a- angel from heaven, preach other than a gospel. Well, I'm, I just, my notes are double, they're copied there. But he's saying, look, these people that, are, that preach that, that they are, they are, they are uh, they're reserved under the darkness, uh, blackness of darkness forever. That God is going to, to, to punish these people severely, these false prophets. And that we are to call them accursed. You know, that's why I have no problem, you know, calling these false prophets out and calling them for what they are. And, and telling people, you know, sternly, you know, when it, when it needs to be. We have, of course, you have to use discernment. But often we have to tell people, look, you're being led astray. And if you continue to believe what you believe, you are going to hell. You know, and if it's somebody who's preaching false lies, uh, preaching lies and heresy and these things, if they're the one that's actually leading people out of the way, those people deserve to be called out for what they are. Lying, damnable, false prophets unto whom the darkness of black, uh, blackness is reserved forever. That they are going to have their part in Lake of Fire, and that's where they belong for what they've been, what they've done. They're often reprobate. But I think that's something we can apply spiritually here. Now let's move on here in, in the chapter. It says in verse 19, Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless, and widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. Now, if you if you were with me in these other chapters, you know, we, we went into that more about you know having righteous judgment for for those that you know don't have deep pockets. You know, that's something that is really wrong with our judicial system today i mean you could literally get away with murder if you get the right you know uh, you know uh, the right lawyer and you have enough money you can get away with a lot of things in this world today god's saying look cursed be the person that perverts the judgment of the stranger verse 20 cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife because he uncovereth his father's skirt and all the people shall say amen cursed be he that lieth with uh, any manner of beast and all the people shall say amen Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be that smiteth his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say, Amen. Now, what's interesting is we're going through this, he's saying, and all the people shall say, Amen. You know, he's saying, look, there's, there's no gray area here. You know, you're either going to agree with God and his, and his commandments, or you're not. You know, there's not like, well, you know, I like this about the law, but I don't, not, I don't appreciate this so much. It's all or nothing with God. It's all or nothing with the Bible. He's saying, look, all the people shall say amen. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all, and all the people shall say amen. So he's saying, look, cursed, if you, if you don't confirm these words that are written, all of them, you know, then you're cursed. And that's where people really need to be careful today, especially even in, in, in the, you know, under the umbrella of what's called Christianity today. You know, they need to confirm all of these words, not just the New Testament, not just the portions of Scripture that, you know, tickles their ear or makes them feel good, but all the things, whether they, they, they rub the fur the wrong way or not. You know, and as the, the illustration that I've said often, you know, if, if the Bible's rubbing the fur the wrong way, the cat needs to turn around is the, is the expression. You know, we can't sit there and just demand God, you know, deal with us on our terms. And if we're going to have this attitude that's going to pick and choose from the Bible what we do like and what we don't like, the Bible says you're cursed. That's actually bringing a curse on you. That's, that's you saying to God that you know better than he does, that your ways are higher than his ways, that the, the ways of the Lord are uneven. But God looks back and says, no, your ways are, are, are uneven. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And it doesn't matter. Often we read things in the Bible and they might, they might offend us, they might, you know, they might strike us or take us aback, but you know what? They have, to be, they have to be included. They have to be accepted for what they are. And we have to just step back and by faith understand that these things are written for our admonition, that these things are there for our own, uh, our own benefit. You know, I mean, imagine a society that would allow people to just do these things that are written here, that, if, that everything was just, you know, there was no limits. I mean, it would be a wicked, wicked society. And we already see that taking place. People are, 
you know, pulling back from, from living, living righteously or keeping uh, righteous laws and see how far it's already taken us. So we can't have this attitude of pick and choose in the Bible. It's all or nothing with God. You know, and, and here's the thing. You, know, you say, well, some of, the, some of the things I read in the Bible or I hear the preacher say, they offend me. Well, you know what? I don't think you love the Bible then. I don't think you can say I love the Lord and I love God and I love what's written here if, if, it, if it's offending you. You know, and the Bible says that you, if you, if, if great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. You know, when, when people hear preaching or they, they read something in the Bible and it disturbs them, it takes away that peace, they, have to, they, need, they need to step back and ask themselves, do I really love the Bible? Do I really love uh, thy law? You know, and, and here's the thing. People grow up without the Bible, without knowing it. They're, they're being taught philosophies and ways of living that are contrary to God. So it's kind of a natural reaction when you first get in church or you first start to read the Bible or hear preaching that preaches the whole Bible that, yeah, there might be some times you're going to go, whoa, the Bible says that? What you have to understand is that when that happens, you have to make a decision. Am I going to love that or am I going to allow that to, you know, bring a curse upon me by despising it? You know, our attitude should always be, let me love your law. And if we're struggling in that area, you know, I would admonish us to just get down on our knees and start to pray, Lord, help me to love your law. Help me to love all of it. Help me to, let me delight in all of thy righteous commandments. Because what we don't want is the curse of God in our life. We want the blessing. But that takes effort. We have to get, we're going to have to pursue that. We're going to have to get our hearts right often. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, again, thank you for these folks that came out tonight. Lord, I pray you bless them and to keep them safe, keep us all healthy. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to continue to serve you. And Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for all the things that are written in it, Lord. The things that, that, uh, that might offend uh, others or even ourselves sometimes. Lord, help us to always be people that are malleable when it comes to your word. That we, if, if we find ourselves, uh, Lord, contrary to it, that we would change. That we would change our, our attitudes, our actions, our behaviors, the way we think. Lord, help us to always love your law so that nothing in it might offend us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, thanks again for coming. You are dismissed.